A quick reminder before we dive in, I launched a Swift News newsletter. The first edition went out today. So if you want Swift News in your inbox every Monday, sign up for that. The link will be in the description. Let's dive in. Revenue Cat released their state of subscription apps for 2025. And it's a massive 263 page report helping you make money from your apps. And it breaks down data from 75,000 subscription apps over 10 billion in tracked revenue, over a billion transactions. So huge data set. It breaks down things like what type of subscriptions are being sold per category, like what's sold more, weekly, annual, monthly. Do apps in your category typically offer a free trial? Is it a hard paywall, a soft paywall? What about percentages of trials to paid? What percentage of apps hit revenue milestones within two years of launching? You know, 1,000 number R, 5,000 number R, 10,000 number R. It also dives into retention, acquisition, Google Play versus the App Store cross-platform development and its growth with AI, because the reality is there's a lot more React Natives out there in the world that are using AI to build apps now, and those apps are on the App Store making money, and we're starting to see that growth in these statistics. And the second half of the report drills down per category to get even more granular with the data. Now, I released a video earlier today doing a little bit of a deeper dive on the report, but that is still just an overview. Again, it's 263 pages. If you want to go a little deeper, there's an episode of the Sub Club podcast with Jacob and David of Revenue Cat, and they spend 45 minutes talking all about this report. And then, of course, you can go download it yourself, grab a coffee, take a couple hours and dig through it, which I highly recommend you do. Moving on, we have choosing optimism about iOS 19. Now, I normally don't like to talk about rumors on Swift News. I like to wait till things are official before addressing them. Uh, this is a pretty big rumor, and it seems to be pretty credible from a lot of credible sources, and that is that iOS 19 is going to have a drastic redesign, similar to when we went from iOS 6 in skeuomorphism to iOS 7 in the flat design, like a complete redesign. And the rumors are it is going to be more Vision OS looking. And maybe the sports app that is already released, see this little menu here? Maybe this is a, a sneak peek of what we might be getting. But as you can imagine, a complete redesign of iOS, probably gonna be a lot of work for us iOS developers. So some of us are gonna love this. Some of us are gonna hate this. I would love to hear what your thoughts are. But back to this article, choosing optimism about iOS 19. And David Smith clarifies, optimism isn't enthusiasm, right? Enthusiasm is a feeling, optimism is a choice. I have much less enthusiastic feelings these days about my relationship with Apple and its technologies. You know, they've been kind of slipping up with this AI and Apple intelligence. So even though you're not enthusiastic about a huge redesign, you can choose optimism. And he's not talking about blind optimism, which just ignores the realities of the situation, but more the realistic pursuit of the positives of the situation. And then he goes on to talk about the positive, which I agree with a lot of them. So yes, iOS 19, if they go more of this vision OS look and feel, there's some opportunities here. It provides an opportunity for differentiation, right? When you're a small indie dev, you can move quickly and adopt this new design language right away, where either the large companies, right, they're a little slow to move, or maybe they have a ton of custom components that they built themselves. And now they gotta rebuild all of that to look like the Vision OS app. Whereas if you, you know, use the default UI kit or Swift UI, tab bars, pickers, all that stuff, you're probably gonna get a lot of this for free. And I've been preaching that for a while. Anytime Apple makes a big design change, you just get all that for free versus like having to rewrite everything. Again, if you're an indie developer, when you have limited resources, of course, if you're a big company of all the resources in the world, different story. But being able to adopt this right away and move quickly with your indie apps is a chance to set yourself apart because Apple's gonna wanna feature apps that adopt this new design right away. This is also an interesting thought too, number three. Like it is rumored that the redesign will pull many aspects from Vision OS and the way it is visually structured. So he says, having spent a lot of time with Vision OS, it is fully Swift UI first, which put an interesting thought in my mind. You know, there's this talk of like, hey, if you stay within the guardrails of Swift UI, everything's great. Well, maybe, you know, this old version of iOS is more UI kit native, and maybe this new version of iOS, iOS 19 forward, could be more Swift UI native. I'm just, I'm just spitballing here. There's a high probability this is just completely not possible, but it just put that thought in my mind that, oh, maybe a lot of the flaws in Swift UI could be ironed out when we have like a Swift UI native UI design. Maybe that's just too hopeful, but I don't know. That's the thought that immediately came to my mind when I read that paragraph. And down here to number five, like, yeah, it's just exciting to work on new things. Like a whole redesign of your app may not be the most productive. I get it. You want to work on new features. You want to deliver value, not just make it look different. But yeah, it is kind of exciting to have a whole new look and redesign and just a, a refresh of everything. Actually, it's more than a refresh. It's like a whole new look. So I'm on the side of the fence where that is pretty exciting, but that's just me. So yeah, I would love to hear if you are excited for this new Vision OS-like redesign. Again, here might be a sneak peek of, of what we're looking at. So are you excited for that or are you dreading that?
Next up, we have behind the scenes of async functions. And here, Swift concurrency is becoming an integral part of every iOS app project making a strong understanding of it essential. And yeah, it's no secret. This is kind of the future of iOS development. You don't necessarily have to adopt it right now. A lot of existing projects are perfectly fine ignoring it and not adopting it, but I do believe it's no secret. Going forward, modern code bases are gonna be Swift concurrency. So you're gonna to need to learn it. And that's what this article is. I've been preaching this you know, for a few months now on Swift News, sharing these kind of articles, but this really is just reinforcing the foundational concepts like of async functions. So. We're gonna talk about the async function real quick. There's more topics in this article that I'll let you go and read. But to give you a little taste, right, an async function is a function with an async keyword, obviously. But what does that actually mean? Uh, the simplest way to understand the async function is to think of it as a special kind of function that can suspend during its execution. So like, what does that mean? How do you suspend it? Well, down here, that's where the await keyword comes in. So the async await feature allows you to write asynchronous functions and call them asynchronously by awaiting them. So what does it actually mean to asynchronously wait the function call and how this waiting doesn't block the thread execution? So the async function can be suspended, right? That's what we've established. Well, this only happens when you use the await keyword. When a function encounters await, its execution can be paused until the awaited function call is complete. In other words, await creates a potential suspension point in your code. Okay, but how doesn't it block the thread then? Simply put, a suspended async function gives up its thread to perform other work while it awaits the awaited function to complete. So to put that simply, you have an async function. In that async function, when there's an await keyword, maybe it's network call, or maybe it's saving something in Swift data, the async function will suspend, which frees up the thread for something else to do the work, right? It's not blocking it. That other function goes and does what it needs to do, and when it's done, comes back to the async function, and then it can continue from there. So simply put, what async await does is it allows a function to be suspended, to free up the thread, to do other work, and then when the work it originally did was done, comes back to it and continues. And it's a very efficient way to do that. Now that was just the basics of async await. Again, this article goes into tasks, uh, executors, I think I'm gonna get this out of order, jobs, executors, actors, we're gonna get the executors in a second. I don't know why that's like sticking out in my head. But yeah, just the, the basic functions of, you know, Swift concurrency. So this is not like an advanced article. This is more of drilling home the basics and the, the foundational topics. But I always say, this is a big topic, Swift concurrency. You're gonna have to repeat it. I'm still reading these articles and I'm still like, solidifying the information in my brain. Like I always say, you don't just do one tutorial, you don't just read one article and you know it. Like I'm reading Swift concurrency stuff constantly and I'm just now kind of feeling like, all right, I'm, I'm getting the grasp of it. So Swift concurrency is a big, big topic. It's gonna to take a ton of repetition. So go read this article. While I believe you should be learning Swift concurrency right now, don't wait on that. Whether your project should migrate to Swift 6 in the strict concurrency, that's a whole nother topic. And the answer, as you'll see here in this Donnie Walls article, is probably no for right now. And he walks through some steps on things to consider before you migrate. And that's taking an initial inventory of your code base, like how much concurrency are you actually using, how modularized your code base is, because the more modularized it is, the easier it's gonna be to update, because if it's not modularized and it's all connected, you're gonna find that uh, a lot of your objects will touch Swift 6 concurrency, and then you're gonna be in sendable hell where you're trying to send stuff and like everything's connected. So if you just blanketly adopt Swift 6 and you're not modularized, I have a hard time saying that word. <laughs> uh, you're gonna find that it's just, it's gonna be a huge refactor. So the more modules you have, the more compartmentalized things are, and the easier it will be to adopt Swift 6 concurrency module by module. Another thing he mentions is make sure your team is ready. Have they taken the time to learn Swift 6? You don't wanna throw this on them if no one on your team has like ever touched it or knows nothing about it. Like that's gonna be a pretty heavy lift. And he also talks about like, it's essential to understand how much concurrency you actually need because Swift concurrency is, by design, going to introduce a lot of concurrency into your app when maybe you don't actually need all that concurrency. And he gives the example, like if you're just running network calls where well, that goes to the background thread and then you come back to the main thread to update your UI, which is probably a lot of apps, you don't necessarily need all this swift concurrency stuff. He says, you might've already adapted async await and that's completely fine, but it probably means you do have more concurrency than you actually need, which was interesting to me because I actually hadn't heard this before. This article sparked me like, oh, I gotta, I gotta research that more because my thought was like the whole structured concurrency aspect of it, like mainly the, the syntax, how easier it is to read and understand and it's uh, less mistake prone. Like we, on the closure base, right? There's taking a network call, for example, there could be like five exit points based on various errors thrown. Whereas with the async await, the structured concurrency, it's very easy to read. All the exit points are covered like by default. So that was my advantage for like Swift concurrency, but he kind of introduced a new thought here that like, I might not need that. And 
you know, we're introducing concurrency when we don't need it. So that's something I got to think about. I don't know, that was just a little random thought that came to me uh, as I was reading this. But if we go to the conclusion, he'll say that basically right now it's not quite ready yet. Let's scroll down to the bottom here. So in conclusion, overall, I think adopting Swift, Swift 6 is a huge undertaking for most teams. And I've said this too. If you're going to adopt it, make sure you're going to reap massive benefits from it because it is going to be a heavy, heavy lift. Unless you're building a new project right now and you can just do Swift 6 concurrency from the beginning, that's a different story. But we're talking about migrating an older existing project. And yeah, Swift 6 concurrency is pretty complicated and Apple is still actively working on improving it and changing it. So, you know, for that reason, it's going to be changing. So if you want to wait for it to be more stable and Apple is still learning by themselves, they have a new manifesto out where they're making Swift 6 more approachable. So it's still very, very early to sum it up. So basically, Donnie recommends, and I agree with him, I wouldn't migrate an older existing project to Swift 6 unless you feel it is like absolutely necessary and you're gonna get tons of benefit from it. Lastly, we have a cool design resource called Screen Designs, and this is basically every screen in an app and you can horizontally scroll. So here's ChatGPT, right? You start with onboarding and as you scroll, you're going through every screen in the app. So if you need design inspiration or you wanna flow inspiration, just look at some apps. You can just keep scrolling through. You're gonna see every single screen. So that's just ChatGPT. Here's Duolingo. Again, you got the onboarding. I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through fast here just to show you like how many screens, you see? I'm, I'm like scrolling super fast, but you can see every screen in the app. Again, this is just for design inspiration. If you're thinking about a flow or thinking about a certain screen or wanna see how UI is done, this is an amazing tool. And then I'm gonna scroll down really fast too just to show you all the various different apps on here. So just an amazing resource if you're building an app and you're like, man, I need some inspiration for what these screens should look like. So again, this is gonna be the whole app. Here's Deezer, I don't even know what this app does, but scroll across. Get all the screens here. Again, just some, some design inspiration. Now that is just the apps. You can also do app store screenshots, which is really cool because app store screenshots are insanely important to get downloads. So you can just scroll through and look at a bunch of app store screenshots for some pretty big and popular apps. But again, keep scrolling down, keep scrolling down. There's just tons of them. And I know I'm going fast. You probably want to see the pretty pictures, but I'm going fast just to illustrate the, the depth of inspiration that you can get while you're sitting here uh, looking through this. Pixar, yep, cool. Cool screenshots. So that wraps it up for this episode of Swift News. If you want to see my deeper dive into the Revenue Cat Report, check it out. It's right here. See you next week.